Okay, Chair, we're live. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, we're here for our June meeting of the Economic Development Advisory Group. Uh, there is an agenda in front of us. And um, what I'd like to do is deal with the agenda and uh, then we'll uh, move on and get to the substance of the meeting as quickly as we can. Is there any comments on the agenda, a person to move the agenda as is? Thank you, Councillor Little, seconded by, thank you, Michael. Any discussion or comments on the agenda, anything to add? Okay, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. Uh, the next we have our minutes of our last meeting. Um, can I have a mover for those minutes, please? Thank you, Paul. Seconded by Tracy. I think I saw Tracy's hand. Sorry, Barbara. We can, and third it by Barbara. Um, and uh, any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Now I got to go back. Um, so um, it's got. I, I have a just a little item in here on the. Um, on the update on Markdale and Beaver Valley Visioning. Um, those activities, uh, as you well know, are, are spearheaded by the municipality. Both, uh, as I understand, are going along well. Right now, there is a public survey that is available for people to comment on the Markdale Visioning. And I would encourage um, us as members of this committee to have a look at it. It's uh, it's, it's on the municipal website, you can find it. Um, and it is asking just general questions around uh, how people would like to see the development of, of uh, downtown Markdale and the community in, in a broader sense. Uh, with respect to the Beaver Valley uh, visioning exercise, there was that public engagement that I know several of us attended. Since then, councils had two special meetings talking about um, uh, different uh, um, proposals, ideas on how to move forward, particularly with the Talisman property. Um, one was a, a, an interested uh, a group of a coalition of groups, actually, of residents and others who have interests in the Beaver Valley. That was uh, three weeks ago. And then two weeks ago, there was a presentation by a group of investors um, who had uh, an idea for developing the Talisman property with uh, certain sustainable and economic uh, objectives. Uh, the municipality is um, currently um, noodling things through as recently as earlier today. Um, it is their um, mandate and obligation. The reason I'm clarifying this at this point in time is I have had personally several calls asking what the Economic Development Committee is doing about Talisman, Beaver Valley and Markdale. And I'm, I'm reiterating the point and wanted to have it sort of um, um, uh, memorialized in these minutes that it is a, uh, we are involved as individual citizens if we want to be, this committee does not sponsor either of those activities. Um, we do, are interested in them. We're encouraging ourselves as individuals to engage in them, but it is the Paladi who is and not the Economic Development Advisory Group. And it's uh, and 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 I'm not trying to avoid anything in saying that. I'm just in case there's uh, any confusion over our role in those activities that are ongoing. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Paul. And just an update uh, from today's in-camera meeting that coming out of that, Councillor Little, Councillor Allwood, and myself will be uh, representatives of council to um, um, interchange with any proposals that are coming forward to council from the public or community or whatever comes toward council. We've set up these uh, three individuals that will be the contact for more in-depth discussions. Okay, so you're Kathy, developing your that, process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? I, I'm just trying to go by memory of the motion that was passed. Uh, no, that's, uh, that, I think that uh, captures it. 
So any, um, any other questions or comments about, um, yes, uh, Director Harris. Thank you, um, Chair Harold. I, I just wanted to say in regards to the downtown Markdale visioning survey, it will close this Friday. So far we have 245 responses to it, which I think is pretty tremendous. I'm really excited about that. Um, we will be after the Beaver Valley corridor visioning sessions, we are working on a survey following that and it should probably be out in a week as well. So the, the process continues for both of those projects. Thank you. Yes, uh, Paul. Michelle, through you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Harold. Um, Michelle, do you have a, a, an update when we'll be getting those reports back to council? With I think one time it was talked about early summer with regards to the visionary sessions. Thank you. Um, we are proposing, and I need to speak to the clerk, that the downtown Markdale visioning project will be presented at the July 21st council meeting. And the results from the Beaver Valley corridor visioning session, we're anticipating those from the consultants in early summer. So I'm hoping um, by the end of July, and it would be lovely if we could get it before council before the August recess, but I don't know if that's a possibility. But that project actually, just if I could speak, the Beaver Valley project, um, given the level of public input, it's taking a lot of time to consolidate all the comments and make sure they've all been addressed. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so you're busy beavers trying to get it all done. <laughs> we are, or the consultants are, and we just get to work with them, so. Okay, good. Okay, so that's uh, all I want to say under uh, 5.1. And um, do we really need a motion for that? Uh, I don't think uh, that's really not. Oh, yes, come on, that's do, not please. taking a position. i uh, moved by the mayor and seconded by Councillor Little that, uh, that the update has been received for information. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried, thank you. Okay, Mr. so um, as Mr. as Mr. Chair, yes, so, did you do the declaration of pecuniary interest? I don't remember that. Um, no, uh, we didn't. I apologize for that. I just wanted to get down to the exciting presentation from Director Harris that I uh, uh, skipped over that. So, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Has anyone put an offer into purchase talisman? Um, that's on this group. No, apparently not. I see no declaration of pecuniary interest and uh, therefore we will move forward. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Councillor Little. Um, 5.2, uh, as you know, and just to, uh, by way of introduction of this, my, I, I, um, this is our, our fourth meeting. We met in March and said hello to each other. Um, in April, we talked about a draft work plan and then in May, we approved that work plan and we heard uh, Councillor Little uh, told us all about the rural ends and served some donuts um, and, and told us about alternate approaches to economic development. Um, at this meeting, we want to continue that um, uh, exploration phase. We want to talk about social enterprise and some of the uh, legislative processes that are, are both um, uh, powerful, but also limitations to municipal engagement. Um, in July, hopefully the next meeting, we'll talk a little bit about uh, general trends and demographic things that are going on, and perhaps uh, also talk about other models of economic development that are out there, including um, perhaps even behavioral theories of economic development. Um, and also, I think at that time, we'll want to talk a little bit about metrics uh, around um, how will we know as a committee or how would the municipality know as uh, an organization that it's moving in the right direction? How should we evaluate what we're doing? And uh, I think that'll be our July session. Again, a context point is that September, October, and November, we have... Um, we have time to 
uh, really develop, I think, our core, our first draft of core recommendations. And this will probably take the form of developing a, a working paper to start with and then have the lots of discussion around that and, and opportunities to improve it and, and expand it. And then um, by November sometime, have that document ready to go talk to council with. So sometime in the early fall, we'll book a meeting, a workshop meeting with council in November. And then we will um, be able to present that paper to them at that time. Um, and then following that engagement with council, of course, we'll then start uh, looking at ways to engage and I, ju I just got a message from Amanda that the recording has stopped. Maybe um, maybe uh, Amanda's power has gone out again. Amanda, are you online? No, I guess her power has gone out. Um, and I don't think there's any other way to, I'm surprised the meeting's still going if she was the host. Um, anyways, um, I'll, I'll, yes. Hi, um, thank you, Chair. I just got a notification that I have become the host, so I will hit record, and if Amanda comes back, then we will uh, give it back to her. Okay, great. Okay, so what was the last word I said? So we, um, the, we had a slight interruption in our recording, and I hope we're back on track now. Um, so... Mr. Chair, you got to go right back to the beginning again. Okay. <laughs> uh, at, at least it's not Director Harris's report. Uh, the um, and so we will. Um, so the idea being is that um, over that fall period between now and to, to September, we're still going to be gathering up information and and figuring out how all these pieces fit. And then we will uh, start producing something for council's engagement, then the public's engagement. So we're on schedule. And today, I think it's, uh, we got two, I think, very important sessions to go through. One is, as I said, uh, social enterprise, which will uh, save for the dessert. But the main course will be uh, the presentation from uh, Michelle about uh, some legislation, legislative processes and and um, and uh, you can take it from there, Michelle. Thank you so much, um, Jim. Yeah, so Jim left me with the one that is kind of dry, and I generally like doing presentations that I just have pictures and we have great chit chat about them. Um, this piece um, is specifically dry. Um, it deals with legislation. So you're going to find a lot of words and references to legislation, et cetera, in here. I have no intention of reading these or going through slide by slide. I'm hoping that everybody just keeps it as a primer so that we understand some of the things that we're dealing with. And I'll, I'm happy to speak at it. I'm at a high level and then answer any questions. So I know we've been having lots of discussion related to economic development. What is economic development? And as Jim said, we've, had, we've talked about donut economics. We're gonna talk about a lot of things. I've taken this really dry definition of economic development um, because I think it's important to juxtapose it to community development and then have a discussion on how the municipalities department is currently operating. So when you see this, this is really around these, the very traditional definition of economic development. And we obviously know it can mean different things to different people, but this one looks at it from a municipal point of view or a government point of view where it's about the allocation of limited resources, land, capital and entrepreneurship and how those, those things impact business activity, the viability and economic sustainability of a community. On the other hand, community development supports activities that are much broader, I would suggest, and while community development takes into account economic development, it also talks about social and environmental and cultural impact on a community. And 
um, as you can see in our organizational structure, um, we have an economic and community development department. So we combine both of those things. And um, I think if you specifically have put in the presentation, you know, what the vision for our little department is and um, what our mission is. And I, I'm really proud of our mission, um, you know, to build, I think it speaks to what we do every day, to build a strong, resilient and sustainable economy by connecting and facilitating partnerships with both internal and external stakeholders. And by internal, I mean, within our own municipality, we really try to promote and encourage a holistic view at the municipal level related to economic development. Um, we create and implement business and cultural programming by maintaining and leveraging our built and natural spaces. Um, we really try to honor our commitment to the multitude of community groups and organizations who contribute to the well being of Grey Highlands. And I think um, in some of our preliminary meetings, we talked about quality of life and how that is such a critical part of that. And I really do believe that the work we do every day in our department tries to tries to meld those two sides of the portfolio. And I, I often tell people that in my mind, economic and community development are two sides of the same coin. I put a little word cloud together. Um, I started to explore some of the economic development functions. Um, that that oftentimes are attributed to economic development work. And it goes, you know, from business retention and expansion to government regulations, community development, land and property development, investment attraction, tourism, advocacy, marketing, job creation, zoning. And why I wanted to put these here is that there is a complexity in what we do. Um, I have a colleague, a, a really good friend, actually, in the ActDev business, and we were talking about this um, recently, about how it seems that in municipal government, if it doesn't fit somewhere, if people don't know where it belongs, it gets landed in the economic development department. We don't know how we're going to deal with such and such. Let's give it to the economic development department and they'll figure out how to do it. And I think um, in, in my conversations with my colleague, we talked about the fact that economic development does not have legislation directly tied to it. Um, we're going to talk in a minute and we're going to reference the Municipal Act, which talks about the governance of a municipality as a whole. Um, there's the Planning Act that, you know, obviously dictates how planning takes place. But economic development tends to skirt in between all of these various um, legislations, and we are impacted by them, but don't have our own legislation. Um, from a municipal consideration, I, I had the privilege of speaking in February, just before COVID hit, in February of 2020, at a provincial forum on um, tourism issues. And they asked me to speak because I used to work in the, pri in, in the tourism sector as a destination marketing organization. And now I work inside municipal government and they were very interested in how, what I observed working on sort of both sides of the, um, the equation. And some of the things that, um, you know, I learned and I spoke about is that, you know, first and foremost, I referenced that the municipality is governed under the Provincial Municipal Act, which gives broad powers to municipalities and what they are allowed to do from a process and practicality point of view. Um, there's a lot of references in this presentation, which you can all read one night when you can't sleep, related to the Planning Act and how that dictates some of the work we do. Um, there is public accountability and transparency in the private sector or in other walks of life. You can work a deal. You can come up with a entrepreneurial solution that makes the best sense because it is how you think it should be done. And um, you could talk to experts on it. But at the end of the day, the decision is the people who are involved in it. From a municipal point of view, um, as we all know, the 
we are beholden and responsible and have a responsibility and an accountability back to our ratepayers and our public. So ever, almost everything we do needs to be have a public forum and an opportunity for the public to observe the process and provide input. Um, I should also would be remiss to talk about the role of council. Um, just to be clear, in a municipal setting, Council is the one who sets policy and is the ultimate decision making body. Staff can provide input, we can make recommendations, we can use our professional expertise to, to provide some insight into any given issue. But at the end of the day, Council is the, as George W. Bush would have said, the decider. So um, we have to keep that into. In, in, into account in everything that we do. Um, through public engagement, there is an opportunity, you know, as part of the public accountability and transparency, there is also a lot of collective wisdom and insight related to community and community assets. And there's an opportunity um, through our process to engage with the public who often can provide valuable input on decisions that are being made. Um, probably the biggest one that I struggled with when I came into municipal government was the municipal budget process. I'm used to having a you know a pot of money and accountabilities at the end. As long as you deliver on the accountabilities, it doesn't matter if you move some from one pot of money to the other. Um, we don't have that flexibility in municipal government. Um, every year, council establishes and approves a budget, and though that budget is is generally based on the strategic priorities approved by council, and any significant deviation from that budget requires council approval. So when we talk about being able to be nimble and make quick decisions, there is a process that has to be followed and when somebody comes forward and said, can we have a decision on this by next week? Oftentimes the answer is no, not because we don't want to, but the decision making authority is beyond staff's ability. It has to go before council and there is a public process and timelines related to that. I would be remiss because my CAO is probably sitting on my shoulder if I didn't speak about joint and several liability related to municipalities. Um, we are told time and time again that because of this concept, um, a municipality may only have to be 1%, considered 1% liable to be held accountable for any legal action related to an insurance claim or a liability. So that risk and liability is a big part of what we do. Um, I will give you an example. Uh, I'll make one up. Um, a group comes forward and wants to put forward, you know, put in a swing set. And well, we can put in a swing set at this park and it'll only cost us $250. We got a good deal on wood. We got a good deal on this. Um, if that park, if that equipment, if that generous action isn't up to municipal standards, it is unlikely that we can take that generous offer, which would be fine in your backyard, or if you were doing it as a private citizen, but as a municipality, we are limited in regard to that. The final one I wanted to speak about is procurement policy. Um, we, I took a, another dry course about a year and a bit ago from a procurement expert related to government. And um, each municipality has its own procurement policy. We have ours that you know, has limits on um, what, what contracts or services you can procure without going through either a quote process or a tender process. Um, one of the biggest things we probably get into, and I think it's really important for this committee to understand is while we like to support local, with the, and I think it's the Federal Procurement and Trades Act or something, we are actually not permitted to give any preference to a local procurement um, provider or a local service or product provide, provider. And um, it's just something we have to bear in mind that sort of limits how we operate. 
there are a variety of planning tools and I've listed them in here. Um, everything from zoning bylaws to site plan controls to height density, subdivision review, um, employment lands, um, all of these things, and I will not bore you with them. I'm assuming you would have at least glanced at this documentation, but all of these planning policies have significant impact on the work we do in economic development. Um, I'll speak, for example, to employment lands. One of the things right now that we are dealing with at the municipality is we are getting a lot of requests from people who are interested in setting up businesses within Grey Highlands, but they are looking for things like serviced lots and um, where there is municipal infrastructure. As you probably know, our serviced areas are our fully serviced area is in Markdale, and our secondary settlement area is in Flesherton. Um, we're trying to work now and understand with our planning department, is there an opportunity to ex expand employment lands and what employment lands do we have available relative to um, requests now we're getting for people to put in affordable housing, for instance. So um, a lot of these things I would say are way above my pay grade and that's why we have a director of planning and his great team, but they all impact sort of the vision and the work we do in economic development. Um, there are also a variety of financial tools that a municipality can use, but it should first be stated that generally municipalities cannot provide financial assistance to bodies that undertake manufacturing, industrial, or commercial activities. Um, that is generally called bonusing. So, you know, I, I get people sometimes, well, what will you do for me if I relocate my business to Gray Highlands? And we can't do that through the Municipal Act. We cannot bonus one particular company, but there are a variety of tools that are permitted under either the Planning Act or the Municipal Act, and I've referenced some of those here. Um, as you know, we do have a community improvement plan in place that we introduced in May, I believe, of 2019. There's a heritage tax relief program. Um, there are opportunities for municipalities to work um, with other agencies related to facilities agreements. Um, oftentimes, you'll see that in municipalities, uh, YMCA, for instance, may enter into an agreement with the municipality to provide recreation services. Um, the other big one that I want to mention without um, referencing is they there's been there is a lot of talk and they're used very effectively in some communities um, business improvement areas or BIAs. Generally, those are tied to a specific um, geographic area and those businesses in that um, defined geographic area once a BIA has been established. Um, are taxed or there's a levy on their property taxes that supports the BIA. Um, the municipality of Grey Highlands does not currently have a BIA. There had been some talk just before I started and I believe it's in the economic development strategy that the municipality should consider establishing a BIA for Grey Highlands. I don't believe that um, the entire geography of Grey Highlands could ever be considered as a BIA, but there would, if there was sufficient interest, be an opportunity to um, identify certain communities if that was a direction council wanted to, to take moving forward. Um, there's also ECDEV corporations or municipal services corporations. There's also an opportunity for municipalities to get involved in business incubation through small business programs. Um, one of the things that um, Jim and I have talked about is um, the taxing authority um, and that the municipality has opportunities through taxing to perhaps encourage business development in certain areas like our downtown cores. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that moving forward. Um, I think what I really wanted to stress here is that there are tools that we can use in economic development 
And there are also probably 501 things that an economic development plan can choose to address. And I think, you know, I've, I've put some considerations in here for building a local economic development plan. And I think when this group starts to look at a work plan and perhaps recommendations back to council, it's around assessing priorities and strategic opportunities because there is no way that um, a municipality of this size with our finite resources can ever take on all of the things that could conceivably fall within an economic development portfolio. And, and my experience tells me that the best economic development is when the economic and community development is rooted in community values, when it's very strategic, when we all agree that there's certain priorities that we believe we should be undertaking to move the bar forward. Um, I've often said in my past life that sometimes it's okay to say no, um, we can't possibly do it all. So where are we going to have the biggest impact and help um, move the municipality forward as it relates to the strategic priorities that have been determined by council. Um, I, I, I encourage you to watch the video that is in the at the end of this presentation, what is economic development, it is done by the city of Winnipeg, it is very simplistic, but I think hits a lot of the key points, and I thought it was particularly interesting because they use ice cream as their um, sort of example of economic development and given that we live in Grey Highlands and could be considered the ice cream capital of Canada, I thought it's a very telling video so I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions and uh, that's my dry boring presentation around municipal whatever Jim called it, <laughs> tools, legislative tools and enablers. Thank you very much, Michelle. I, I, just a couple of comments. Um, <clears throat> I think your characterization of economic development being that area that uh, is viewed as somewhat of a, of a, um, of a uh, problem dump um, where uh, things arise and, and they say, you go solve it, economic development, is true in two aspects. One, some uh, issues will come up that are bridging between planning and, and uh, community matters, and it'll end up in economic development, things like short-term accommodations. Um, but other things that have often happened with municipal councils that I've seen time and time again, and less so with the current one, is economic development gets established and then everyone looks at that individual and says, well, go do economic development. Economic development has to be a, 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 a built into everyone's performance review, whether it's a roads foreman driving by a pile of garbage that's been thrown out the window by someone else, or whether it's someone on the service counter or someone in planning or every counselor or the economic development group, everyone has to have that economic development idea and principle in their mind as they conduct their work. Um, and I, I, with apologies to the gardeners in, in the uh, group, I, I, I sort of characterize economic development as a rhizome. You know, one of those things that grows and expands horizontally and has roots all over the place. And, and every time you try to um, uh, get rid of it, you know, pull a little bit of this out, the other parts get a little bit stronger and it keeps growing. Well, economic development is sort of like, should be like that rhizome that goes through a whole organization. And there's many entry points and the people who are looking for um, and, and want to invest in the community can enter into any one of those entry points. And, and the point of the, and an organization has to be able to respond to that in a way that isn't built on silos, isn't built on individual mandates and that's not my job it's their job it has to be something where, where the whole team works together um, and and so what happens what happens in some in some municipalities um, and some of them close close very close to home 
um, you end up with conflicts, inherent conflicts. Right now, the, 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 uh, the municipality of Gray Highlands very much encourages revitalization of, of uh, village life. Uh, you know, encouraging economic development in the villages, commercial operations. At the same time, the interpretation of the zoning bylaw for home occupation allows a retail operation to close in Markdale, go to their house, operate it as a home occupation, retail, lots of traffic, pays no taxes. Why wouldn't everyone do that? And right now I could get in a car it's still double park and, and take you to um, three or four instances where that's happened over the last five, seven years where home, home occupation shouldn't be retail. Uh, home occupation should be home occupation, no traffic, no disruptions, those types of things. But those conflicts arise out of history. No one did it deliberately, but those are the things that a unified approach to economic development should sort out. And zoning, when it comes to that, zoning is one of your most powerful tools a municipality can use. They could put limits on the size of new, new retail operations in, in, in the urban, in, in the village cores um, in order to keep, perhaps if they want to keep big boxes out or to encourage big boxes in, they can do that through zoning. Um, so there's lots of power in some of the legislation, the official plan and the zoning bylaw are very powerful instruments, very powerful. And they should be written and, and reviewed in terms of development of, of quality of life and, and, and the economic viability of the community. Um, so thank, thank you, Michelle, for putting this information in front of us. I agree that it is, there's a lot to go uh, over there. Um, uh, you picked the wrong video, though. I have spent a lot of time in, in Winnipeg, and I would never buy an ice cream cone uh, because it would probably um, never unfreeze. Um, but anyways, that's a whole other story. Um, what I'd like to do is see if anyone else Jim, any comments Jim, or questions. Yes. I yes. Yes. See Barbara's hand up. Oh, I can't. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Hi, Barbara. I was Hi just going to say. Any questions or comments from anyone? There you go. Uh, so, so first of all, thank you for the presentation. I, I did read all the detail because I'm just that way. Um, but one of the questions I had was one of the things when I think, especially with the Beaver Valley and the environmental sustainability kind of vision, I, I think it's such a beautiful area. And if I think of the all of the G7 summits and everything that are happening right now, a lot more with the sustainability is happening. And I absolutely agree that we have to kind of target, like you said, we can't, I always say to my team, you can't boil the ocean, you know, what can you do and deliver and meet the strategic goals? If we think about all of that, how does it tie back into if there is more of a federal or a provincial um, release of legislation or I'm more interested in any funding or anything that we could lean on to help us as we look at the, like I'm thinking of the visioning exercises when they come back through. I'm sure there's going to be something with regards to sustainability and maintaining the beauty in the community that we have. Uh, that's an assumption on my part, of course, but just as we see all that, how does that flow back in that we could potentially lean into? Jim, would you like me to start that one? Absolutely. Sorry. And then, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish it. Okay, or thank you. Add to it or, or I could whatever. just let you start and I could just not, I could just sit here. But um, so a couple of things. So the environmental thing, and that's why, you know, when you're linking all of these pieces together, everything that sort of we do in our own department here, we look at the municipal strategic plan. And as you've all seen in that, there are five pillars and you can see that sustainability and environmental sensitivity is embedded as sort of an overarching philosophy in everything that the municipality is considering. Um, you know, when we look at it, and Barbara, you had asked me um, when we were corresponding back and forth this week about, you know, how do we look at specific communities related to some of the work we do? And um, first and foremost, we look at it through a, um, the entire Grey Highlands lens, but being respectful of each of the communities. And 
I will tell you that, um, you know, we've identified sort of eight towns, villages and hamlets. They're not the only ones, but they're probably the, the largest ones that we, we've sort of done as our major points of consideration. Um, heaven forbid that we call them all the same because they were all um, proudly um, championing their own individual identity, but we also have to look at the broader impact on the entire municipality. We um, try, like through our downtown revitalization and Hamlet project, we, we try to give everybody their due, but kind of like my children, um, I love them all, but it's not always equal. They all get what they need, but it may not all be at the same time. Um, regarding how we engage and look at federal and provincial um, programs and how we connect to that, that is a huge part of the work that we do at the municipality through the active department. Um, I think I've subscribed you all to our newsletter. So every single day we get all of the provincial programs, we get the federal stuff that's coming on. We curate those, we bring it forward to say, how does this impact? We share that information and try to make sure that we are cognizant of opportunities. Um, I think if you probably listen to most council meetings Things, there is generally a discussion, well, maybe there's funding for this and maybe there's funding for that. So we try to integrate all of those into our thought process. Um, so th there's, I think, you know, it, when you look at the mission we've decided, we've um, stated for our department, the word facilitating is probably the um, biggest part of what we do. Um, we, we, we are matchmakers, we connect people, we hear from a business and they'll ask us a question and we'll go, oh, well, we know somebody who's looking for something or we just heard about a program that might support you or let us put you in touch with the business enterprise center because we know they're working on something. So it's, it's, it's so we're all over the map and at the same time, try to be fairly focused on the priorities that we've identified. So I know that's a really broad and vague answer, but we're on it. Don't know that we're necessarily good at it all the time, but we try to, to, to manage it and keep an eye so that we are leveraging every opportunity we possibly can to move our agenda forward. And just to add just a little bit, um, the... I think the antenna are, are fairly well up and attuned to any new announcements that are out there. Uh, part of the problem with many announcements that come from the provincial government particularly is that they're specific and targeted for certain activities only. Um, I have had three recent meetings with the federal government on other matters, um, and they are starting to talk more and more about uh, community prioritized funding. And so it's instead of having deliver, everything delivered in a box saying this is for housing, this is for transportation, this is for uh, water and sewer infrastructure, um, they're thinking and, and, and are receptive in some instances to say um, take those numbers and what's the priority in your area versus this area? Because some areas might not need the housing one, but they definitely need the water and sewer one. And so uh, there, there, there's, it's actually, as I said, come up in three meetings. Um, it's not the way it's going, but I wouldn't be, uh, I would be encouraged if that type of thinking uh, continued, because if all of a sudden, uh, I mean, the, the recent funding for, um, for transit, um, uh, regional transit to Great County, I think is a good idea. But I don't know if that was at the top of the list or whether it was second or third or fourth and whether other things would be at the top of the list if it was more community prioritized funding as opposed to central prioritized funding. Anyways, that, but the, the, the idea is to, just to listen carefully when ideas are out there with various funding opportunities uh, is, to, uh, is to get on them. And, uh, and I think uh, the municipality does a, a reasonable job at that right now. And we just have to, and at some point in time, perhaps even this group may get involved in some of that uh, uh, in helping fulfill and complete um, requests. 
any other questions to Michelle on her um, tome of information? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, Paul, you're on. Uh, yeah, you just a uh, great job, um, Michelle. And I think that's a good document to sort of maybe once we get back to in person or whatever to have a document like that, maybe at the counter or, or an item like that, that explains what that is because uh, uh, it, you pull together a lot of information, a lot of good information. I know some of us see that all the time, but there's a lot of people that don't. And I think that you put a lot of work into bringing that together. And, you know, it's sort of the go-to um, guide, so to speak, that has a lot of information. So don't keep, keep it. I think having it in print form or having it, having it handy, I know, not everybody likes print form, but sometimes to build it for our staff at the um, at the office, be even the planning, just to have. I think that's a, you know, a great. You put a lot of work into that uh, and, and pulling that together. So I think that's we've always. I know you've touched a wee bit on planning in there, but that's something also from a planning perspective is also having that because a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people don't understand a lot of parts of the intricacies of, of municipal life in the sense of what it is. So you've you've enriched them in, in that. So thanks for that. Thank you. Terrific. Any other comments? And uh, okay, uh, now I'm not quite sure whether I'm going to turn it over to Chris or to Tracy at this point in time to talk about social enterprise or maybe both. Who's going to unmute first? Jim, can we actually just get a motion to receive Michelle's presentation before we move on? No. Yes, Please. we can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Barbara is moving that and it's seconded by. Thank you, Michael. Any dis further discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, Amanda, for reminding me. Krista. Thank you, Chair Harold. Um, both myself and Tracy are going to chime in uh, with this presentation. I'm going to start off. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Amanda's given me that uh, that power, that privilege. Um, I'll share my screen and I'll get going. Uh, Tracy, um, Michelle, if any, if you want to jump in at any point, please feel free. Let's see if uh, if this works, and then when. Let's see. Are you seeing my screen now? Got it. Excellent. Okay, good. Um, so Tracy and I were given the assignment of uh, social enterprise, and we thought it would be a good idea to, um, I guess, start off by chatting a little bit about what social enterprise, uh, what what it is, and it's 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 a pretty broad definition. There's no real uh, true definition of what social enterprise is. Uh, there's no unified definition in Canada, uh, according to, to CRA. And it, it really kind of spans a spectrum from a traditional charity that then sort of, you know, brings in some additional revenue. And then you kind of move more into a self-sustaining business um, where the profits then are reinvested then you kind of move into a more of a for-profit enterprise, but it maintains um, standards of verified social environmental performance, uh, public transparency, which is also known as a B Corp. Then it kind of moves along the continuum again into more of a uh, traditional business, which may or may not, I guess, circle back to uh, investing profits or supporting uh, social causes. Um, Again, it really falls anywhere in the spectrum. And all right. So um, I guess I was really brought into uh, the social enterprise world as, as a project uh, in, in 2020. Uh, in a former life, I had kind of dabbled uh, in it through some um, nonprofit work that I had done. But in 2020, the municipality of Gray Highlands was really fortunate to partner with the municipality of West Gray, as well as Georgian College's Social Enterprise Network of Central Ontario, also known as SENCO. Uh, with funding support from AMAFRA uh, to launch an initiative aimed at uh, growing and fostering social enterprise in, in both our communities and within the region. 
the goals of the project are, are pretty broad. Uh, it's to enhance, to help enhance the knowledge of uh, council and staff and to kind of foster again that commitment, the support to social enterprise. Uh, it's providing uh, training opportunities and networking opportunities, which are really valuable for social entrepreneurs. So people who kind of have an idea and they're not quite sure where to go with it. Um, there's a series of workshops, which I'll discuss now in a, in, in a moment, that kind of help take that idea and, and flesh it out a little bit more. Um, it's also aiming, so through this project, it's aiming to enhance the capacity of emerging social enterprise coaches, which, uh, which I assume includes uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Robert, who works uh, uh, in our department with the museum, as well as two colleagues in the municipality of West Gray and our directors, of course, um, to, to support social enterprises. A big part of, part of that is identifying um, a potential for social enterprise, chatting with them and helping uh, bring them through to seeing their idea uh, through fruition. So again, it's kind of equipping the toolbox to, to recognize and foster and support these enterprises and to help kind of where next. And if and, and I'll just be really upfront as my disclaimer, uh, I'm not an expert in social enterprise by any means, um, but through this process, through this program, we've made some really great connections with people who do this 100% uh, full time. Uh, they have the connections. We've been able to connect people in our communities to the proper resource people, or even just to each other uh, to learn more um, about wh what next, how, how can they move their idea forward. So I alluded to earlier, we, uh, we kind of launched into things with, um, uh, with a documentary screening. So when we kicked off this project uh, in September, there was a preamble, there was a, um, a social enterprise one-on-one -on -one session that was held with both, both the Gray Highlands and West Gray Councils and involved staff and as well our, um, our Senko Institute counterparts or, or project leads, I guess. Um, so that session then led into a drive-in screening, uh, what I think might have been the rainiest night of 2020 uh, at the, uh, the Hanover Drive-In and the social shift was screened. Uh, so this is a documentary that uh, kind of explores examples of social enterprise almost all the way across Canada because they ended in Halifax, they didn't go to Newfoundland. Uh, so um, this was kind of that general introduction, which then led into facilitated sessions. So over the course of four weeks in the fall and then five weeks in the winter, there were uh, facilitated sessions led by uh, Senco instructors and supported by Gray Highlands and West Gray staff where people who had an interest in social enterprise, whether they had an idea themselves or just wanted to learn more about it, um, came to these sessions, attended the workshops, uh, which was a lot of, in addition to straight up instruction, there was a lot of um, uh, activities and, and kind of ideation and, and, and brainstorming, which was, which was really fantastic. It led to some really great conversations and really great connections. There will be more of these workshops taking place in the fall and absolutely you will all be, uh, be advised of when that's taking place. And I encourage you all to attend and learn more um, about the social enterprise. There's a couple of case studies locally in Gray Highlands. Uh, one of the, I guess the most obvious ones that we talk about a lot is, is, is the Pennywise Thrift Store. This is a really great example of an enterprise uh, it's a charitable organization. It's run by volunteers of uh, the auxiliary of Centre Gray Hospital. All the proceeds that they create are, are, that are generated from donated items are then reinvested back into the local hospital and other community projects. So they're a really good example of a, um, of a, a, a charity that's running a business that's reinvesting the profits back into, into their projects. And as well, we have the Hanley Institute in Flesherton. Uh, they just received a registered charitable status. And so they partner with community uh, organizations throughout the community and they offer opportunities and remove barriers for youth. Um, so they do, um, some of their programs are a fee for service and then that money is then reinvested back into programs um, in, in the community and it just helps uh, grow and increase and strengthen their, their offerings for the betterment of the, the community. 
in some of the ways when we talk about social enterprise, it's um, it's about increasing opportunities. And one of the ways that we can do that is through social procurement. And this is when you look at a, a proposal or um, or a submission, it's not only look at the monetary value, but also of the social and community uh, benefits, in addition to what you would traditionally look at uh, during a procurement process. And strengthening the, the business itself is one of the potential outcomes, but also when you look at, uh, you know, supporting these businesses, you're also uh, supporting broader community uh, benefits, uh, to all suppliers and providers. It's a really, it's a strategic approach to purchasing goods and services. Uh, for example, the city of Toronto has implemented a social procurement policy where they uh, attempt to make sure that uh, along several parts of their supply chain, there is social enterprise represented, that there is a, a social and community benefit to, um, to, to the process. And then another way uh, social enterprise can be supported um, in, in the community is there's, there's a couple of examples. And I did a really great program actually through the University of Waterloo a couple of weeks ago about uh, local in inclusion and diversity in local economic development. And one of the, the presenters provided these examples um, of how to encourage and foster social enterprise and you know, kind of as a, as a result or, or through that promote inclusion and diversity. And one of that is a local investment fund where people uh, throughout the community come together, they pool their money, almost like, almost like crowdsourcing, uh, but for very specific targeted initiatives uh, for community, uh, for betterment, for programs uh, that benefit the community. For example, New Don Enterprises in Sydney has, I think it's nine unique companies under their umbrella and it's meal programs, it's uh, you know, supportive services, and it's a really great example of if a, for example, if a municipality on its own can't put the money, uh, you know, to, to support or to, to seed fund some of these social enterprises, maybe there's interest amongst the, the general community to take on something like this. And I've included a link here where um, we can, uh, where you can learn more about that and we can certainly discuss it more. Um, then another option is the city as a shareholder. Uh, so some large municipalities, for example, in Kitchen and Calgary, or the Kitchener, sorry, and Calgary are two um, that, that come to mind. They kind of, they rise to the top. They're pretty popular. Uh, they've actually created investment funds, which is a, which they use as a catalyst to attract investment. They drive innovation. And, you know, some of this is funded through um, the, the divergent or the divestment of, uh, municipally owned properties and reserve funds and, um, you know, the sale of publicly held land. So there's, there's a lot of options there, but as, as Michelle mentioned in her very interesting presentation, um, it's not always reasonable or feasible or practical for, for a municipality to undertake things like this as much as we, um, we might want to. There are, there are certain limitations to to what we can do and so now and i and i fear i've, I've run through this very quickly and talked very fast but uh, i will turn Christa, it up sorry Christa, are you able to just absolutely. maintain the presentation since there's not too many slides is that okay absolutely so you just tell thank me when you. okay yep uh, so thank you, Krista. It was funny when uh, Krista and I had our first chat and she said, I understand you're an expert on social enterprise. Uh, no, I am not. So this was <laughs> part of the uh, educational component for me. And uh, Krista was, was very uh, helpful. And thank you so much for being great to work with and, and helping put this together. So what I'm going to talk about is just building on the social enterprise aspect, and it's uh, more along the lines of social innovation. So social innovation really does not have um, a clear definition, much like social enterprise, but uh, if you're not aware of who or what the social first center, social the center for social innovation, it, it's really just a 
a shared space for like-minded either individuals or organizations to um, get together with ideas um, that encourage change. So the definition for who they think they are is that middle paragraph there. And, and because there's so many definitions for social innovation, um, they prefer the one at the top, uh, which refers to the creation, development, adoption, and integration of new and renewed concepts, systems, and practices that put people and planet first. And really that is their refined definition. And it really is about putting people and planet first. And if you really wanted to simplify that a bit further, you would say new ideas for a better world. So next slide, please. So social innovators really are more, um, I would say practitioners rather than academics. And, and they're really looking for the most um, efficient way to create change. And so in anything really, but specifically with social innovation, the three key levers to change are what's noted here. So policy, culture, and markets. Um, and just to provide a little bit of context, so for, for policies, that's really, and you're all aware of how policies work, uh, it's a systems changing tool, um, specifically in fields uh, that have the greatest control or influence. So it's good when there's established evidence to, to kind of prove something, uh, strong support and non um, non-bureaucratic environment, I would say. So uh, some examples would be the green energy policy or the our national healthcare policy. So culture is really just about behavior. It's, uh, it's educating people, um, how we change our minds and behaviors, uh, social movements, um, use social media, documentaries, pamphlets uh, to, to build awareness. Um, but this type of change, takes time um, and you could look at uh, the, the Me Too initiative as, as an example of that. And then markets, of course, markets, we see an ad, it, uh, it creates change. So it provides a strategy for the adoption of a social innovation. Uh, so it allows a lot of people to participate, um, integration of the solution into, into markets and um, you know, how consumers make purchases and, uh, and um, influence, influence the market. Next slide, please. So then there is, so innovation, how does it happen? Well, generally there's, there's four stages. I mean, there's a lot that takes place. Um, anyone who's ever invented anything, they had an idea getting it from beginning to end. There's a lot of things that happen in between. So the four stages are, are listed here. So I'm just gonna go over them in a bit more detail. So you can read the examples here, but for ideation, really it's, it's an intentional process that uh, solves an issue. So for social innovation, society has an issue I have an idea that can solve it. Okay, great. So you use tools like user-led uh, participatory design or change labs um, with the goal of exploring the problem to see what, uh, what solutions are viable. So then comes the invention stage, which is also known as the social in innovation or the social uh, invention. And so this is where prototypes, uh, pricing, products, uh, piloting occurs. Um, so, you know, social, social startups or incubators are well suited for this type of, uh, for, for this type of stage. Um, and then you're trying to evolve these ideas into the next stage, which is the adoption stage, right? You want big business, government, media, uh, they can play an important part. And ultimately um, you want widespread use and acceptance of, of uh, whatever this invention is. And then really the measurement of, of how successful it was is the impact. So when it comes to social innovation, um, you know, what was the visible or measurable change in the world that this invention or innovation um, created? So uh, you can look at carbon reduction. So there is a clear connection between in, in a lot of cities where 
um, specific bike lanes were created and it had a, a direct impact into the, uh, the carbon reduction. So then how do we measure? How do we measure this? And this is where it gets quite uh, interesting because you can't really. <laughs> There's no uh, direct way to measure a social innovation. Really what you're measuring are the interventions or the impacts, because that's really what's, what's most important is the impact. So when we look at this framework, um, we've got the stages and the tactics listed uh, that we just mentioned. So, so if I go through an example, uh, the last column there on the right, uh, if you take something like, uh, we measure the number of graduates uh, from a social enterprise program and they have a lot of ideas. So from those ideas, uh, a lot of, of those graduates have a certain number of startups, right? In, in, lo in a local uh, so social enterprise incubator like CSI. Then from that incubation, um, you have a certain percentage that uh, put products or solutions into the adoption phase. And some of those create an increase in market share for the social enterprises, uh, with the social enterprises they've created. And really the impact is they've employed a number of marginalized people, a certain number of marginalized people um, in those enterprises or businesses. So you've solved a social problem here by employing um, these marginalized individuals. So it's, it's not direct, uh, that's for sure, but, but the main purpose of, of a framework like this is uh, to, to offer um, kind of guiding principles, if you will, because it's not going to be direct. Um, so it, it's hard because if you, any of us who have ever worked in a, in a corporation, um, it's easy to gear your solution towards certain metrics or KPIs instead of really what you're going for is what solution makes the greatest impact. And this is a framework that will help you get to that, uh, get to that point. So then the Center for Social in Innovation, they really take um, you know, people and planet first um, very seriously. And, and so they've created a paper called Building the, next, building the next economy. So the campaign for the next economy is really questioning the current way um, society deals with things. Um, so they wanna provide solutions for you know, a people and a, and a planet first uh, economy. It is right now, it's a three-year plan, but uh, with anything that you're trying to build from scratch, of course, I'm sure that there will be updates to that. Um, but they're looking for new ways to act. And, and I think COVID has really uh, revealed a lot of areas um, where, where this could, could be the most impactful. And so the next slide really is how do they think they're gonna create this next economy? Well, it's, it's uh, pretty, not, I wouldn't say straightforward, but really the chart above is incorporating the five elements that they feel need to exist in order to um, create this type of change. So as we've said, social innovation, there is a social issue that, that needs to be solved. So that's where it starts. Then you're connecting all these people with, with great ideas on, on what that type of solution could be. Um, then you, you want to provide um, people who are working on these ideas with, with the business intelligence to um, go through the agile process. So you have the idea, you tweak it a bit, you put it into a pilot perhaps, then there's, there's more tweaks that need to be had. So, you know, it's, it's validating, uh, tweaking a bit, 
repiloting, et cetera. That's where the acceleration takes place. And then when you get to, wow, this really could be a, a great impactful solution. Well, how do we fund this? So something that Krista mentioned about the uh, community economic development investment funds, um, social, the Center for Social Innovation actually has that within some of their centers. So they do have some funding and, and there's a, a couple of examples at the end. And then and then the solution reveals itself at the end, right? In this case, it's jobs and solutions, right? For the next, for the next economy. And so um, these are just some of the examples uh, and, and how the Center for Social Innovation has impacted um, society. So um, there's a lot of statistics there on the, on the left-hand side, but two really key examples of, you know, some ideas that, that have come out of these um, uh, centers and, uh, and made an impact uh, to the world. So, so when you look at 21 Toys, it, it didn't start out uh, to be what it, uh, what it evolved into, which is fantastic. And that's, that's a lot of what happens with social innovation. Um, you have one issue to solve primarily, but then you realize that your solution could actually solve some other, um, some other of society's issues as well. And, uh, and for um, the lady on the right, uh, she actually received the Governor General Award for, for innovation. So um, there's lots of case studies out there since 2004, uh, CSI has been, been helping innovators of all kinds. Uh, make an impact on the world. So hoping we can do that uh, in the near future in Grey Hatlands. So thank you very much. And these are just some resources that uh, Krista and I put together from um, uh, where we, we were able to uh, get some of the content for our, uh, for our presentation today. Great, thank you very much, Tracy and Krista. And uh, <clears throat> when everyone's finished reading uh, Michelle's We'll go to all those references and read that material as well. Uh, very much appreciated. I particularly like the matrix for evaluation. Um, uh, the very fact that the, the, the two uh, uh, dimensions are, are, are cross-referenced and, and, and you can be able to track how, um, how uh, people have progressed or ideas have progressed through the various stages. I think that's something that we could maybe uh, keep in the back of our mind when we're looking at evaluative uh, processes uh, down the road. The other um, uh, comment that I particularly uh, enjoyed or, or the, the graphic I particularly enjoyed was the one showing that their work plan um, from, from the initial stages all the way through, much fancier than our own work plan. But, but I like the way that it has some similar ingredients around the education, around advancing it and building consensus on the ideas as it goes forward. And I think that's important, not only in social enterprise, but in, in a broad sense of economic development, because it's not anything that's going to occur with a flip of a switch. It, it's going to be something that's going to require a lot of, a lot of, um, of um, information sharing, uh, developing uh, coalitions and, and connections. And that brings me back specifically to uh, Krista, when you're talking about social enterprise, I attended one, at least one of those workshops. And one of the things that I found interesting was when organizations um, weren't a social enterprise in and of itself, but there were connections between for-profit businesses and, and social organizations um, and, and by forming a, a, a collaboration or a partnership, they became a social enterprise operation. Something like a, um, um, uh, one I have in my a theater that it, it was struggling for years because uh, everyone uh, wasn't quite sure of, of its purpose and what happened, you know, was it profit making? Who got the profit? Uh, but their link with a a, uh, a, a uh, women's shelter. And, and so everyone knew if you went to the theater, all the profits went to the women's shelter, helped both organizations immensely because it clarified the purpose and the benefit in the eyes of everyone there. 
So the idea of having organizations uh, link up and create a, a social enterprise partnership, I thought was a wonderful uh, aspect when I first uh, uh, started reading about some of these uh, um, uh, after the first seminar uh, that I attended in that workshop. Um, any other, I see Michelle has her hand up and I'm gonna turn it over to everyone here for questions or comments on the presentation, Michelle. Thank you. I just wanted to mention, you know, when we did some of this training, um, we automatically think about charitable organizations and not-for-profits related to social enterprise. Um, there's a lot of work being done in the municipality that is actually a social enterprise. We could argue some of the work being done by the museums or our libraries are, are very social enterprise-ish. Um, I would also suggest, and I probably one of the biggest re revelations for me is that social enterprise can still be profit driven and it doesn't all have to be charitable. And I think we should keep that in mind. I, I often re refer to it as business with a conscience. So there are a lot of great private sector businesses that have a social value system integrated into their philosophy. And I, I, I just wanted to sort of reiterate that point. I think it was mentioned throughout the presentations, but I, I it was a real aha moment for me when I, I, I thought about that. I thought, okay, this is a, a different perspective. And I, you know, when we've done this work and Krista and Robert have sort of been our key points for this, um, we, we just did our evaluation after year one on the impacts of sort of what this was for the municipality and we didn't get an overwhelming, it wasn't a zillion people signing up for these sessions. But I think what you see here between what Tracy and Krista um, spoke about, it's another tool and another philosophy in our toolkit that we can bring to the table when we're working and facilitating partnerships and relationships with community members and businesses and um, all kinds of partners. So I just wanted to add that. One, on that point, on your first point, one of the um, messages I recall from the one workshop I attended is that there, um, according to the, one of the individuals, is that there has to be a profit orientation in a social enterprise. You know, it's not, um, and, and, and therefore, I would challenge the library and the other municipal organizations. Uh, but it's 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 using the it's the link between the profit side and and the community. I'll call it charitable, small c charitable side that I think really makes the power of the social enterprise, not just the provision of what uh, you know roads. Roads are good for society. That's not a social enterprise. Um, in my mind, that's a basic municipal service. And, and so the distinction, I think, is that there's a higher level of, of, um, of uh, outcome that has to be achieved, where there's a, you know, like the used furniture example that was used in the workshop, uh, where it was very profit oriented, but, the, uh, but all the money was, uh, all the profit, um, because it still was operating as a, as a not-for-profit, all the profit was allocated to social um, benefit. So it's, I also, it's open I like, interpretation. Yeah. yeah, and I like the fact that it forces a discussion in most cases around, I'm gonna say a business case or sustainability. And I really like that because so much yeah. of the work we, we see and the work we do, you get great, um, ideas coming forward and there's a lot of time and effort and resources invested in them but in two or three years they're not sustainable and I like the fact that this approach really looks at sustainability in whatever form that is so exactly uh, <clears throat> too many of us and me included at, at various times get stuck in the ideation box and um, and there's a there's a need to move ourselves, me included, into the invention, adoption, and impact boxes uh, to to really bring bring things to uh, to life. Any other comments or questions from anyone online right now? Yes, Kathy. I was just wondering if anyone was interested. Um, is that 
uh, movie, The Social Shift, is it available or can it be made available? We could look into that. Uh, it was made available um, on two occasions. So we, when we did the screening in Hanover, it was available. And then it was also offered in January as a download um, option, I guess, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Um, I see Michelle has popped up. Did you want to jump in there? Michelle, you're muted. Um, we could certainly look into it. There are licensing requirements. It also is a social enterprise, um, the group who put that together. So they're obviously looking at their business sustainability. So we have to be cognizant that there is a license fee with it, but perhaps in round two, that could be readily available or an option for downloading and something. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before I ask for a motion to receive the report? Uh, yes, Paul. Well, certainly I'll move it, but uh, I did I did go to the drive-in last uh, last fall there and, and did watch the social shift and uh, it's worth watching. It's interesting. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe Kathy, you saw it. I'm not sure, but uh, it's really interesting to watch. And it would be worth, I think if you're going to have to pay a licensing fee for it, which supports that group, but it would be good to have a group that was able to, to watch it. Um, I think it's because it, it does have a lot of value in, in just thinking about that young group that went across Canada. Maybe I'll let too much out of the bag <laughs> that got a trailer and they started from uh, BC and, and they went right across Canada. And I think it was 2017, if I recall, was the year that they did it. So yeah, it's, it, it, you know, they, they stopped at a lot of different uh, centers across Canada and it was, it was quite interesting. So I would say it, it would be well worth but, but together to however you need to do it. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for your motion to receive the report on, uh, from Michelle and Krista and Tracy. Is there a seconder for that motion? Thank you, uh, Kathy. Any further discussion on the presentations today? Okay, all in favor of receiving them? Thank you very much. Um, next meeting is scheduled for July 20. Um, and before I talk about the topics there, is there any uh, under members privilege, is there any points that anyone on the committee would like to uh, raise or, or comment on? Or um, Kathy, I think you suggested earlier that there might be a, a, a collateral document that would be good to distribute. Would you wanna comment on that? Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, it's a social finance primer it's coming out of the um, social finance group that's part of the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay. And um, I was invited to sit on that group. So I've attended one meeting and interestingly enough, it was about social procurement um, and led by Ellie Green, who actually set up our uh, social enterprise um, series. Uh, she's no longer with Georgian College, but uh, she's gone out on her own. Um, Anyway, I just thought it was a really good uh, summary of um, many of the ways that um, financing can be found to, um, I guess, benefit um, our healthy communities. And even before I got on council and then more, even more so being on council, I realized how limited <clears throat> municipalities are in re revenue generation. And um, the fact that municipalities can't be all to all people um, and to um, encourage more, uh, I guess what we're talking about community and economic development um, where municipality can facilitate, but there would be um, resources, hu human resources, financial resources coming from other areas. And um, anyway, so I shared this document as uh, just a summary with um, Jim and perhaps Jim can arrange to have it circulated to the rest of the group. Um, but they did talk about social procurement um, and many of the things that were in Michelle's uh, presentation, social enterprise, B Corp, a lot of, a lot of those things and it, yep. it's some, um, 
it, I think it's just it's sort of a menu, I guess, and um, and just provides us with a little bit of an idea of you know where we might find some potential. So um, anyway, I just wanted to share it with the rest of the group. Thank you, Kathy. I've already forwarded it to Amanda, and I've asked her to attach it to the minutes of the meeting, so everyone will will see it at that point. Any other? Um, Items under members privilege, any comments, suggestions? Any uh, forecasts on who's gonna win the hockey game tonight? Uh, <laughs> okay, um, good. So our next meeting, uh, thank you, Kathy, for that. Uh, our next meeting on July 20th, um, 5 p.m. That's back to our regular schedule. Um, I think um, what I will uh, do for that is I will um, comment uh, a little bit around um, models, uh, other economic development models and, and, and approaches uh, very briefly. It'll be, um, and I'll try to um, uh, in some way link some of the discussions we've already had uh, and, and try to display it in somewhat of a, perhaps a continuum. Um, uh, I haven't developed anything yet, but I'll but I will work on that and pre-distribute it, of course, with the agenda material. Uh, Michael, there had been talk about um, having uh, a, a brief overview of demographic trends. Are you able to? Uh, but we aren't asking for proprietary information or uh, or anything. But no, I, can, uh, I can pull something together. Okay, that would be terrific. And uh, and I think those two items, and then. Barbara, you had mentioned at some point of a, an interest in evaluation. Um, do you have uh, anything particular in mind or would you like to perhaps challenge us with some questions around evaluation of our work as a committee at our, at our next, uh, next meeting? Uh, sure, maybe we can talk offline a little bit more about that just so I can um, understand sure. exactly what we're looking for, but sure. Sure, okay, great. So I think that will give us a fairly uh, full agenda for our July meeting. And um, one of the questions we'll have at the end of that meeting is uh, even with the outline that I presented before is that we were not going to be meeting in August. And I would suggest that maybe uh, would still be the case. But if there is a desire at the end of July that we keep the momentum going, uh, then we can always uh, discuss that at our July meeting. Anything else in front of uh, the group at this point? Um, Amanda, did I get all the motions I needed except for the one to adjourn? Yes, you're right on track. Boy, boy. you can even teach an old dog new tricks sometimes. Um, so uh, a motion to adjourn. Thank you very much, Tracy. And we will see everyone um, uh, at our next meeting in July because I don't think we need a second or, or approval. We just act on the motion to adjourn, I believe. So we're adjourned. Thank you very much for attending. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy the warmer weather. And I, I uh, hope you get a little bit of rain, Paul. Can Thank you do you. a rain dance, Jim? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. You don't want to see me rain dance. <laughs>